Hi everybody, my name is Hannah and this is Pepper and Pine and today I'm going to share with you the 7th grade Waldorf curriculum by Live Education. This curriculum is designed for ages about 12 to 14. I'm going to show you all the books that come in the curriculum as well as give you an in-depth look at each of these main lesson books. But first I want to show you some of the materials that you're going to need for the 7th grade year. You're going to need some color pencils and these are the Lyra brand of color pencils but any high quality quality color pencil will do. You're also going to need your main lesson books and I've got a few of them here to show you. These are the ones that you can buy at vendors online and they have line pages on one side and they have the blank pages on the other side and this way you can do your written narration along with your drawing for your main lesson book. You can also make your own. These ones I made pretty simply. This is high quality construction paper that I picked up from a local craft store. And I have some drawing paper here on the inside. What's nice about making your own is that you can choose the size and how many pages are in your main lesson book, especially if you decide to do a smaller main lesson block, then you can get a main lesson book that coordinates with that main lesson block. Here are some other ones that you can buy from vendors online. This one would be be intended for a younger student in general maybe third or fourth grade because the format is larger and you can see that there are just blank pages but you could also use this one for an older student if you found that this space just wasn't enough to do your drawings and I found that this was suitable for a seventh and eighth grader but I actually like the larger format better and you can also see that I've shown you basically portrait style main lesson books. So this would be with the vertical orientation, but you can also find them with the horizontal orientation. And this is another one that we made, again, the same high quality construction paper picked up at a local craft store. And then we got drawing paper. We took everything to an office supply store and they cut it down to this size and then we were able to have it bound. Now the place that we typically go, they will cut up to 500 sheets for only a dollar. And then the binding is a few dollars and you can also get up to 500 sheets uh, with a three hole punch and it's only a dollar. So you don't have to cut every single sheet. You just get a whole stack of them. So when I made a lot of our own main lesson books and here are a couple other ones, I was able to do a bunch of them all at one time. And I went ahead and I had them bound so that we had the horizontal as well as the vertical orientation. And then once we started our main lessons, then I could pick and choose. I also like the front cover to in some way relate to the subject matter. So if we're doing a nature unit, I like to choose green. I've always used the more vibrant colors for math, but you can do whatever color you want. And you can also just decorate the front as well. So I have a couple of these main lesson books here. This is from the sixth grade curriculum. This is for the astronomy unit. And you can see that there's the drawing on the one side and then the narration on the other side. This was just blank on both sides and we went ahead and drew in our own lines, which is also an option as well. Something else that you're going to need for the seventh grade year, as well as other years in a Waldorf school are watercolor paper and drawing paper. Now this is watercolor paper that I use for pretty much everything but it's not the best one to use for wet on wet watercoloring and I'm going to explain the difference between the two and then show you a better option for that. This is by Fabriano. I picked this up from Dick Blick online. This is 90 pound watercolor paper it has a cotton content of 25 percent now that's what's going to be really important in your watercolor paper because it's going to be getting wet you want to have a good content of cotton so that your paper doesn't tear now this is only 90 pound and so this is pretty thin, but I happen to like this for a lot of different projects, not just watercoloring projects. Now we have used this a lot with our Distress Ink watercolors. Now these are intended to be used as uh, concentrated ink to re-ink ink pads, but I have found that they work really great as watercolors. And at the end of this video, I have linked an entire playlist that has all the different projects that we've done using these distress inks. So when we're using these, which which we tend to use them a little bit drier than a wet on wet watercoloring technique, this paper works fantastic for it. 
But if you're going to be doing the wet on wet water coloring technique, then I would recommend a thicker watercolor paper. This is 140 pound and I don't know the cotton content of this paper, but I'm pretty sure that it is of higher uh, cotton content because when we're doing our wet on wet water coloring with this it does not tear at all it really holds the water very well when you're doing the wet on wet with this paper you'll see that the edges will start to get wet all the way through and they're more likely to tear. Now I'm also linking another video that has my watercoloring techniques and I have shown both papers during that watercoloring video and you can really tell the difference in how the different papers hold up. You can also find that link in the description box below. So this is a really great option for you. This one is by Strathmore and you can find this one online. However, it is really expensive. And so when we are using this one, and also we would tend to use this size for a younger student anyway, but when we're going to be using this one, I might have the children practice or work with a lower quality uh, watercolor paper first. And then when they're ready to do their final, you know, one piece of artwork, you know, their their masterpiece in a sense, then I will pull out this really nice one and they will, they will get to use this one for that one time during that watercoloring session. So this is an option for you if you're wondering how to do this, especially with young kids who tend to go through it so quickly, then having them practice on another piece of paper first is a good option. You can always upcycle these. I also have some tutorials on what you can do with watercolor paper once the kids are done with their projects. That video is also linked below. Something else that you're going to need is some drawing paper. Now you can use the drawing paper loose like this, and then you can bind it into your main lesson book. Now this size is 9 by 12. You can find this at local craft stores. This is really simple drawing paper and I found that when it comes to drawing paper I'm not as particular about the quality. I found that this 70 pound drawing paper works really well. Now this is just a no-name brand but I really also like the Strathmore brand. You can find those also at local craft stores and we have used the Strathmore brand in order to do our main lesson books. And so it's a it, it feels a little bit thicker, which is especially nice when you're going to be using your fountain pen, which is another thing that you're going to want to have for your seventh grade student. I think they start using fountain pens around fifth grade. And so it's the typical fountain pen. You don't have to get it from a Waldorf supplier. You can get it anywhere. It's the one that has these little vials of ink that you just push into the pen. Now it does take a little bit of practice in order to get used to using a fountain pen, but something else I would recommend you getting, and I've had a hard time finding these ones recently actually, but it is a correction pen, and this allows you to erase the fountain pen and then you can rewrite it, but you'll have to rewrite it with this pen. So this is something else that you might have. Of course, you can still work with pencil, but this really makes the main lesson books, it just kind of takes it up a notch and it really suits the older student really well. So those are some of the things that are extras that you will need. Oh, one more thing I forgot to show you, and that is a compass. And this is for the math, but you might be able to use this with other uh, main lesson books and, and you'll you will have probably already gotten one of these starting in fifth grade because you definitely need one in fifth grade when you start with your geometry main lesson blocks and then again in sixth grade so this is something to have on hand especially if you haven't gone over the geometry main lesson block so let me show you all the books that you get for the seventh grade year. You get an introduction to the seventh grade year, which is a thin book. This is not a main lesson book. This is going to go over what's going on with your seventh grader. And I'm going to go into this one a little bit more in a minute. You get the age of exploration and discovery, and this is quite a thick main lesson book. You get physics two, and this is going to continue the physics main lesson from the previous year, and this is also quite a thick book. You get European 
geography, and again, a thick book, and this will complement the history units. Renaissance biographies, again, a thick book. You have an introduction to algebra. This one's a little bit thinner, and I really like the way that algebra is introduced in this grade. You can also save algebra for eighth grade, and on occasion, I have even had to save algebra until ninth grade just to really make sure that my child was prepared for the new kind of math, the abstract math, and the and for my child to be ready to take on those new uh, that that new way of thinking, basically. Perspective drawing is also its own main lesson, and that is a little bit of a thinner book. We have uh, Wish, Wonder, and Surprise. Now, I had mistakenly put these as 8th grade. It's possible that these are for the 7th grade and 8th grade curriculum. I apologize for not knowing for sure. When I got all of our curriculum, I went ahead and labeled them with my own little labels because it doesn't say the grade on the front. And so I went ahead and did that for just my own organization. But there is some flexibility in where you're doing the lessons, especially once you get to the upper grades. Now, some of the other main lesson blocks that you might wanna have on hand are from the sixth grade curriculum. You have the sentence, sounds, and melody. This main lesson book is a good book to have on hand so that you can revisit it anywhere between fifth grade and eighth grade. Nature, number, and geometry is another one that's good to have on hand, especially with some of the architectural lessons. Those are going to come up in your history main lesson blocks. Astronomy is another good one to have. This happens to be one of our favorite main lesson blocks. You can definitely do the beginning part of this main lesson block pretty easily, pretty simply. There's a lot of really beautiful stories that are drawn from the ancient Roman and ancient Greek mythologies for the different constellations. And then I really like the second part of this main lesson block. It brings in astronomy and math in a very practical way. The last book is The Middle Ages. And this book is actually only scheduled for a four week main lesson block in sixth grade. But I found this to be such a rich uh, main lesson block. It could really span, you know, easily 12 weeks. And if you didn't do this the previous year, then I would definitely bring this in to seventh grade to complement the European history and European geography. And if you didn't get a chance to do this one, but you still want to spend more time doing it, then I would just push the rest of the history blocks out until eighth grade and really spent a lot of time doing this one. When we did our middle ages unit, we've done this now twice since this will be, I'm doing this now with my third child. The first time we did it, we followed the main lesson book pretty accurately. The second time we did it, we turned it into a unit study rather than a main lesson block. And we included a lot more other resources and projects. And we did an additional unit on the Silk Road and the Silk Route and that, that kind of really expanded the, the geography of the Middle Ages. And otherwise it's a little more European centered. Okay, so let's go through these different main lesson blocks, or actually the, the different books. Now this is actually not a main lesson block. This is going to introduce you to the seventh grade student. And what's great about these introductions is that if you are not familiar with the Waldorf philosophy or you just need a bit of a refresher on it, this is gonna go through what is going on with your student at this age and what kind of lessons are being introduced and why they're being introduced and how to rotate your main lesson blocks throughout the year. So it really gives you a nice bit of foundation on the Waldorf philosophy. Now it also is gonna go through all the different main lesson blocks that you're going to have for this year and it gives you a little bit of background information on each one, which is really nice to have in your introduction. It's also going to give you a list of your recommended main lesson blocks or main lesson books. And those are the ones that I showed you that there's the grammar one, the astronomy, geometry. And actually I did not show you the nutrition main lesson book, I either, never got it, I can't find it, or I lost it. So I apologize that I can't show you that one. It's also gonna tell you the materials that you need. Now I went over with 
I went over these materials with you earlier on in this video. You got your main lesson books, your color pencils, your different writing tools, watercolor supplies. What I didn't show you were the watercolors that are typically used in a Waldorf school and those are the Stockmar watercolors. While those are really fantastic watercolors, especially to use when the children are really younger, I really started to love our Distress Ink watercolors for a lot of different reasons. Again, I would recommend that you check out the video on watercolor techniques for more information on that. You can also use some simple watercolors from a local craft store. That's going to work just fine. This is uh, a curriculum and a philosophy that uh, encourages you to use high quality materials and I think that is the the best thing that you can do for you and your children but it's completely understandable that that's also not an option all the time and so when it's not an option for us we tend to buy less of the highest quality that we can afford and we'll just use it a bit more sparingly and with a bit more festivity when we actually do use them so rather than oh we watercolored every day watercolored every day with like cheap watercolors it's like we watercolored once a week or once a month with the best and it became this this thing to be celebrated so that's an option too you're going to get two different kinds of experiences and both of them are very valid when your child is doing something very regularly it becomes traditional for your family so if we're always watercoloring on fridays using the highest quality watercolor paper and watercolors, it becomes something really regular for that child, something that he and he or she can expect and will remember as something that the family always did. But when you're only doing this one time, if you only can do this once in that year, then it becomes celebrated and something that your child will definitely remember because you only did it once. So you can think of like your birthday, for instance, how special of a day that is. But if you were getting presents, you know, every Friday of the year, then it wouldn't be quite as significant. A chalkboard is something that you're going to see in a lot of Waldorf schools and even in a lot of Waldorf home schools. I do have a chalkboard. I absolutely love it. We have really beautiful chalk pastels. And again, I've linked a video down below for you where you can see a lot of the chalk drawings that we've done throughout our homeschool, but it's obviously not 100% necessary to have that. What I would recommend instead, and this is something that we do often, is to have a main lesson book for you as the teacher alongside with the ones that your children are having so that you can do the drawing alongside with your child if you wish to do that. And that serves a couple of different purposes. I found that when I'm working right next to my child, he has an easier time copying what I'm doing. But when I'm working on the chalkboard, I'm usually in the way and he can't really see what I'm doing and I have to move out of the way and it, it, it just kind of wasn't as easy as I expected. The other thing that's difficult is that a chalkboard is black and your paper is white. And that made for a difficulty when it came to using black or white. So if I used white for shading or white, you know, for highlights rather, or white to create a space on the black chalkboard, it became difficult for my child to recreate that on his uh, white paper. You'll probably find that it's easier for your child to copy when you've got the paper right there next to him. And also, and this is probably an even bigger perk, is that you get to keep those drawings when you're done. They can go into your own uh, textbook. I mean, because there are no textbooks and workbooks. They Those main lesson books become your textbooks and workbooks so that you have it the next time you revisit that particular main lesson or your children will really love to go through those and again you get a keepsake rather than having to erase the chalkboard when you're done. It's going to go over your materials that you need for all your different main lessons which is so valuable for this particular age group now in this grade rather. Now I did show you some of the things that you were going to need but there are a lot of other materials here that you need especially for your acoustics or your physics main lesson block. I found that there were a lot of things that the first time we did physics and it wasn't for this grade it was for sixth grade. I had a really difficult time finding the things that I needed and plus I kind of delayed in getting my materials together. So I highly recommend that you go through this ahead of time so that you can find the materials that you need. Now I want to show you 
two kits that I think would complement this main lesson block. This will be for the physics main lesson block. This is called Electromagnetics and this is by Scientific Explorer. It's a little kit. There are so many kits on the market. I know that Scientific Explorer has a number of other ones as well. And this might be something that could complement that main lesson block very well. Simple Machines, we have had this for ages and it just does not get dry in our family. We have had this literally probably for 10 years. This is by Learning Resources. This is called Sh Simple Machines. And, and this can be used with as young as, you know, kindergartners just having fun assembling them all the way up to, you know, an upper elementary grade level to be used as its intended purpose for uh, pulleys and simple machines and other things that you can do with this. So this is going to be a good addition. Even if you don't incorporate into your main lesson block, we have really enjoyed that kit quite a bit. The Waldorf curriculum works on a block rotation. So each one of these main lesson books are a main lesson block that you will focus on for a period of time and then you will move on to another main lesson block. So you're actually not doing these lessons simultaneously. You're not going to be doing every single one of these books every day. You're actually going to be focusing on one particular main lesson block and you're going to go through the entire main lesson block and then you will move on to another one. Now there are some exceptions. The introduction to algebra as well as this sixth grade book called The Sentence Sounds a Melody, these two main lessons are actually ones that you can spread over a longer period of time and will work simultaneously with some of your other main lesson blocks. Now this doesn't always happen and I'll explain that a little bit further in a minute, but I want to go through the block rotation because this book will give you a sample schedule for rotating your main lesson blocks throughout the year. Now, a main lesson block is a concentration on one particular subject area for a period of time, anywhere from three to six weeks. And if it's a longer main lesson block, it's advised that you break it up into smaller main lesson blocks. So you can see here that these main lesson blocks aren't more than three or four weeks. There's a lot of wisdom behind that. When you break up a larger main lesson block or when you just simply have a smaller main lesson block to begin with, you are concentrating that period of time on that information and before it has a chance to become dry or boring or tedious, you're moving on to another main lesson block. Now a lot of these main lesson blocks may have to be repeated throughout the year. You're not repeating the same information, but because the main lesson block is so large, you're going to divide it up into two different sections. So when you're revisiting that second section later on in the year, it's going to be a natural review process for the first part of that main lesson block that you already covered. Simply going through your main lesson book is its own natural review. And I've noticed that my children really enjoy that process, not just in the school year, but years later, they really enjoy going through the main lesson books. Now, we rarely follow this particular schedule. We tend to do our grammar and math in the fall. On occasion, actually pretty regularly, we'll have also a science unit in the fall. And generally, this is because where we live in Southern California, and when we start our school, generally the beginning of September or late August, it's still really hot. It still has a summer feel to our uh, to our homeschool. And so bringing in one science unit, and usually this is a science unit that we didn't get to the year before, works really well for us, as well as whatever math or language arts we really want to concentrate on for that whole year, we'll start it out in the fall. Then in the winter, we'll move into our history units when we tend to want to just be at home and the days are shorter and cooler and we just want hot chocolate and read books, then we'll do our our history units in the uh, winter. Then in the spring, when the kids just don't want to be at home anymore, they just want to get out, they just want to get in nature, we'll do our science units just because it's really hard for us to do head work in the spring. It's not like we're never doing head work in the spring and it's not like we don't read in the fall but we have this natural rhythm that we have just tuned into and that's what we'll end up doing with our with our school year and our block rotation. Now, the way that main lessons are approached are different in my opinion than other 
curricula that I've seen in general, and let me just take the Middle Ages uh, main lesson block as an example. When you start your lesson in general, you will have a multi-day approach for your lesson. Now this will vary between different families and different schools, and I'm going to share with you two different methods right now. The first method is to go ahead and retell and by retell, what I mean is that these main lesson blocks are actually resources for the teacher. So you are using the information for this lesson as your research information that you will read through and then you will deliver to the student. So you will read this ahead of time and then deliver this lesson to your student on day one. On day two, you will move on to the second lesson. And at the same time, you will go back to the previous lesson and do one of the activities. Then on the third day, you'll move on to a new lesson, do one of the activities from the previous day's lesson, and then come back to the first day and maybe do a written narration or drawing. So this is a little bit confusing in my experience to keep this all in your head because our days are so dynamic we don't have quite this rigid of a schedule. This works so beautifully in a school when there is a little bit more schedule naturally within a school system. At home I find that this schedule doesn't work as well. Now on occasion I won't have time to pre-read the information ahead of time and I will simply read this aloud to my student or I will read from a book that we got from the library, preferably a living book that is that really brings the information to life. If there aren't lesson activities, which is kind of rare, you could do a, a written narration on one day and a drawing on the next day or you could do your own dictation or your own copy work for that main lesson. Another way to do this is on day one, you give a little snippet of the whole lesson. So on day one, it's just kind of wetting the appetite. It's a little bit of a, a, a the, the rough uh, elements of the story, the blueprint of the story. Then on day two, you come back in with the full story. This works really well with history because history can be really dry when you're just looking at the names and the dates, and it can be very rich when you're telling it like a story. So if you want to be authentic to history as best as you can and, and say as, as unbiasedly and, and un, embellished as possible, then day one would be your opportunity just to give the dry facts to that historical situation. But on day two, you can really bring it to life with the story, the, the people, the situation, the culture, and all of those things that really bring the story to life. Then on day three, you will start the whole rhythm of your review process, your new lesson process, and then your, your written narration. So on day three, before you start the new lesson, you have an opportunity to review the previous day's lesson. Now the review process is so important with this two to three day learning cycle because you'll notice that there are no tests, no workbooks, no quizzes in a Waldorf curriculum. So the way that the student is learning and remembering the information is by going through it in this review process. Now you don't want to do this all in one day. You really need to split it up over several days because the process of sleeping and letting that information digest and seep in and be processed is so important in the whole learning process the whole learning process. So do give yourself ample time to go through these main lessons. It takes about two hours a day to do the complete main lesson, which includes the review process, the new lesson, the lesson activities, any narration or drawings that might go along with it, as well as lesson activities. Now, you also will have morning activities. Now, I like to keep our morning activities separate from our main lesson block, even if the two will have elements that crossover and that are complement one another. So the morning activities, they can be as short or as long as you want, depending on what you're going to put in them. Some of the things that we include in our morning activities are mental math, 
walking on a balance beam or some kind of physical exercise. It doesn't mean going outside, although that is really important for some children. Sometimes a brisk walk outside really gets them prepared for school. I found that that did not work well with my children, and so doing something indoors suited our family better. So maybe a beanbag toss, maybe taking some dice and rolling them and then adding the numbers together or multiplying them together as a little math activity, going over vocabulary or spelling words is another great thing to do. So you can get really creative with your morning activities and I have a video link below that's going to go through all the different morning activities that we have planned for the school year and then maybe that can give you some ideas. Okay, so once your morning activities are complete, then you can move into your main lesson block, which takes up to two hours a day. And then following your main lesson block, and this is especially pertinent for the seventh grade year, you can then begin to do a little bit with your algebra because that's one main lesson block that you might want to spread out over the entire year, especially because this is introducing a new way of thinking that's going to be possibly a little bit challenging for your seventh grader. Now, I really like the way that they have introduced algebra in a very hands-on but very understandable yet imaginative way. I know that all seems contradictory, but it gives you the, the very basic foundations of algebra in a in a non-rigorous format. It takes you, it eases you into the idea of algebra. And this is something that you might want to do just a little bit every day over a longer period of time. So the end pages of this book are gonna go through what's going on with your child between the ages of 12 and 14. This is going to be especially helpful for you, not just as a parent, but as a teacher, so that you know why these different subject matters, subject areas have been chosen and why they're being taught in the manner in which they're being taught. You're really benefiting from all of the different subject areas that have been chosen for that particular age group. All right, so let's go through the main lesson books. The first one, An Introduction to Algebra, is one that you could probably spread over a longer period of time. It has a very gentle introduction to algebra. You're going to notice that there are a lot of words and not a lot of math. This is story-driven, and it really brings the application of algebra to the student in a practical way. Renaissance biographies, this is a typical main lesson block. This will take about three to four weeks. This book comes with a lot of information already, but you are still free to supplement with other books, either from the library or ones that you purchase on your own. And you can see that the drawing portion of this is going to complement the, the drawing main lesson block that has also been scheduled for this year. So you have perspective drawing that's going to complement your history main lesson block. And this is something that I really like about this curriculum is that you see how all of these different subject areas coordinate together to really make a complete curriculum for the year. So you had perspective drawing, biographies, then you have European geography, and this again is going to complement your history units. You can see that there are a lot of really beautiful original drawings in this main lesson book. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a great opportunity to pull out your art supplies and really get creative with your drawings. I highly recommend that you use a larger main lesson book for this one or that you bind your main lesson book after you do it so that you can use a lot of watercolor paper. All right, we have Physics 2. Now, this one is going to continue what was already introduced the previous year. And the way that the physics lessons are performed are a little bit different than other main lesson blocks. In general, each of these lessons are going to have a demonstration. And on the first day, the teacher will pull out the demonstration and perform it. She then will put it away, and then the teacher will narrate back to the student what she did, which requires the student to form that image in his head. The following day, so day two, before the new demonstration is performed, the student will recall orally the demonstration that was performed the previous day. So you can see that there is always at least a two-day learning cycle for each lesson. 
and you will definitely need additional materials for this main lesson block. So do purchase those ahead of time so that you're ready to go. The age of exploration and discovery. This main lesson block is going to work really well with the other main lesson blocks for this year, but it's also going to act as a nice preview to US history, which is going to be a main lesson block for eighth grade. All right, so the last two books are Wish, Wonder, and Surprise, and also the Wish, Wonder, and Surprise Reader. Now this is going to be your creative writing and English literature for the year. And then you also have your resource book with different poems and uh, essays and things to complement this main lesson block. All right, so that makes up the seventh grade year. I feel like it's quite a packed year with a lot of different material to go over. If you've used this curriculum, I would love to hear your thoughts about it in the comment section below. And if you want to check out some of my other curriculum reviews, you can click on the screen right now.